Hello, Castec community. I'm Chris C., the founding director of the Castec project, coming to you from the land of the Web3. Today, I'm joined by Will Corkin, the co-founder of MantraDAO and Soma Finance, to talk about what does it mean to actually run a DAO and build tools for DAOs. Uh, there's a lot of DAOs that talks about how amazing the future is, but they're just hanging out. Uh, but this is a project, this is a community that's actually working together, building things, and actually making real impact to see what DAO can do today and then plan for what it can be tomorrow. Welcome, Will. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, Will uh, is in Hong Kong, which is my hometown, and as well as Bert. Uh, this is New York, and so we are kind of like switching places, I guess, uh, and, and, and really enjoying our surrounding. We have an, an, an NFT NYC here around this time, and, and it's really exciting to see people converge here to talk about uh, you know, the, the Web3 from the angle of M NFT. But obviously, uh, DeFi and DAO, maybe it's not the most uh, topical thing today, remain one of the driver of the type of uh, engagement and new promise of coordination happening. Uh, so I'd love for Will to introduce to us the Project Mantra DAO and then current focus on Soma Finance to get a sense of like what, this inflection point uh, of this particular kind of learning that we have in the last two, three years, uh, and then the, 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 the opportunity that's right ahead of us now that tech is ready and we're just like, hey, what can we do together? So what is your thoughts? Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, happy to share. It's definitely been a, a super exciting and, you know, nonstop past couple of years, you know, since the kind of the emergence of the DeFi bull run, mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in, in 2020. Um, so kind the of yeah, taking summer, a step back. Right? Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, so I'm actually, so from Boston. So yeah, not too far from uh, from where you are right, <laughs> right now. Right, right. So we definitely did a, a bit of a switch. Yes. Um, but we actually have, a you know, a couple team members based in New York, uh, more on the Soma Finance side, but I'll mm -hmm. get into that, you know, a little bit after. Um, so, you know, live here in Hong Kong, been out in Asia for the past eight or so years, um, been in the, the crypto blockchain space since about 2016. Um, through a, you know, a handful of different projects through kind of the first bull run and then bear and, you know, now through a couple of the cycles. Um, but the kind of the main focuses these days, so have, you know, MantraDAO, which is a, a multi-chain DeFi ecosystem, or, you know, what we're saying now is say, you know, vertical, vertically integrated, um, you know, full DeFi stack mm -hmm. uh, that we launched in August of 2020. So really right at the beginning um, of, you know, the, the crypto summer back then. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, you know, a really exciting time. Um, originally, when we launched, we did a token sale for, you know, our current DAO um, governance token, which is OM, uh, mm -hmm. OM, not OHM. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> and so then, you know, originally, we were actually looking at the Polkadot ecosystem, um, you know, planning to be one of the first kind of DeFi dApps and uh, DAOs and kind of staking platforms on Polkadot. Yes. Uh, of course, back then, they still needed a bit more time. So we decided to you know, pivot a bit and, you know, launch initially with Ethereum. Right. And, yeah. you know, we were, we were super lucky that the team of, of devs that we built internally were, you know, absolutely badass, um, you, know, you know, really, really strong. Um, and we were actually able to, you know, within a couple months, put out, you know, on Ethereum, a pretty much a full DeFi suite. So it started with staking, um, then we launched our uh, money markets, so, you know, allowing people to lend and borrow against a number of different assets, you know, kind of the mm -hmm. USP with that, separating from, you know, what Compounder Aave was doing is we, we did a focus on, you know, a lot of kind of small to medium cap tokens. Right. So, you know, at the height, we had, I believe, 60 or 65 different assets on there for people to supply and borrow against. Um, then from there, we launched a, a launch pad called Zendit. Uh, mm -hmm. la last year, I think we helped to, you know, launch, uh, I think, 85 or 86 different projects to our, you know, community of Sherpas, um, which was, you know, really great because, you know, pretty much what we did is is we created the full DeFi, you know, flywheel and ecosystem. So, you know, we would help to to launch with these different assets, um, with these, you know, new tokens. Then we'd help to set up staking pools for them. Then as they grew, you know, larger, we could help them integrate into the money market. So really like the full suite as people are, are launching. Yeah. Um, and do you, and see, your, other... do you, do you mm -hmm. see your users actually following that journey as like mm -hmm. uh, using the same yeah, tools no, and kind of? Absolutely. Because for them, uh, you know, be, besides just, um, you know, some of the kind of public sale tokens, you know, a lot of them also, we would, we would actually do um, the launch pads with private sale tokens. So ones that were vested and locked. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of them saw, you know, saw these projects, believed in these projects, you know, more long-term because ultimately they were the ones that, 
if the community likes them, likes the project and wants to participate in sale, then that gives us reason enough to actually launch it on, on the launch pad. Um, so we did actually see a lot of them that, you know, it wouldn't just be buying and then dumping immediately, um, which, you know, is definitely prevalent in a lot of places. We mm -hmm. actually gave them the tools so that, you know, they could grow with the to with the project that they invested into um, while being able to, uh, you know, earn yield on, on those, you know, assets through staking. Um, and then the kind of the final piece when we, when we first launched and, you know, kind of one of the big revenue drivers for the business has also been the validator node business. Mm -hmm. um, so really early on, you know, that was, again, as ETH 2.0 was, was just about there. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of hype around it. You know, we saw kind of big, um, big possibility in terms of, you know, what POS chains, you know, proof of stake chains uh, were going to become. So, you know, we, we ended up investing in becoming um, early validators for, you know, some of the big chains like, you know, DOT, KSM, Matic, uh, mm -hmm. Luna. Um, which we do still support on, on the new and the old, um, mm -hmm. as well as a number of others. Um, and so since then, we've actually, you know, now we run uh, 25 to 30 different uh, POS chain validator nodes. So that's mm -hmm. something that, you know, we, we continue to build and, and that's a big part of kind of the roadmap going forward. Do you, do you, do you allow uh, other of the community members to participate in the validation or is it just something mm -hmm. that you guys are doing yourself? No, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely a, a very retail focused um, uh, service at the moment. You know, we do mm -hmm. run them for the different chains, but we do, you know, promote for our Sherpa community to go and delegate their assets to the Montreal notes. Um, and we actually, about maybe six or seven months ago, we started um, what we're calling the Delegator Rewards Program. So, you know, further incentivizing mm -hmm. our Sherpa community to delegate, you know, let's say their, their Matic tokens to the Montreal um, Polygon node. And then, you know, if they do that, they can come over to the Montreal web app, um, they can connect their wallet, and then they can earn enhanced uh, earnings in OM tokens. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a dual token rewards uh, system. So that Very we've, cool. you know, we've, we've, we've seen... Uh, as a huge benefit to get people to come on right now. It's, it's live for, uh, Adam, uh, Matic, uh, dot and KSM, but plan to, you know, eventually integrate all of the different, um, POS nodes that we currently run onto that kind of delegated rewards system. Do you guys have plan to support like uh, avalanche and subnets and stuff like that? Because that's getting some, some, some traction within the development community. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, to, to a degree, um, we are, you know, we're somewhat POS chain agnostic. You know, we want to support as many promising POS chains as possible. Um, so, you know, all of those guys we're already in discussions with or, you know, working on spinning up the nodes as we speak. Um, so we, we, you know, as of right now, like I said, you know, 25 to 30 different ones. But, you know, the goal is, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, get to 50. And then from there, you know, go to 100 plus mm -hmm. um, as well down the line. So that's kind of, you know, big part of the, the roadmap going forward. What's your thoughts about the uh, uh, Beacon chain merge? Uh, is that do you, you know, that seems like a watershed moment for POS acceptance uh, instead of just being kind of like an experiment? And now one of the mm -hmm. most important platform Ethereum is moving to this POS model. You guys obviously are, are aware of, of of those kind of movements and stuff like that. What do mm -hmm. you think is going to happen to the POS community when that happens? Uh, I mean, it's it's really it's it's tough to say in terms of. You know, we're, we're definitely very bullish and, and hopeful in terms of, um, you know, what the outcomes can be in terms of driving more people into kind of the, the POS ecosystem, let's say. Um, you know, it's definitely been talked a lot about and talked about for a while. So, you know, only time will tell once it's properly released to see what the, uh, the outcomes will be and, and kind of how it's, uh, how it's welcomed. But we think that, I mean, it's going to be a really strong move in terms of, of uh, how everything's structured and how people look at it. That's yeah. You know, I think you know the the proof of stake has so many variants. Like you know, from the dedicated proof of stake of the EOS era, even before that, uh, to now this beacon chain thing. You know, we deploy our protocol on Gnosis Chain because we are basically okay. a smart contract wallet uh, ecosystem. And obviously, Gnosis Chain, which used to be XDAI Chain, uh, mm. uh, is a kind of you know moving from a more traditional kind of proof of authority model to mm. the beacon chain model. So mm. like we'll be the first one to sit in the seat, at least technically, maybe not mm. from the community point of view, to see that happen. So it's really exciting yeah. uh, to Absolutely. be on on the train in front of the real
real train, like with a little <laughs> tiny little train. It's like, hey, you know those chain people, you guys are, you, you, you're going to be uh, the guinea pig here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I mean, it, it's really, it's amazing seeing, you know, there's there's a lot of incredible developments. Um, you know, even, like I said, within the past two years, we saw the emergence of DeFi and all these different, you know, decentralized finance, um, you know, ingenuities and really game changers with how the traditional systems work. I mean, look at DEXs. DEXs mm-hmm. and AMMs, you know, can totally restructuring what the traditional centralized exchange and, you know, centralized order book systems, you know, look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, you know, POS, you know, kind of overtaking PO, you know, proof of work, different, yeah. um, chains. So, you know, we're, we're really bullish in terms of how things are, are moving forward. And, you know, that, that goes, you know, across the technical side, as well as, you know, now into kind of the regulatory side. Right. So, you know, a big thing for, you know, of course, in the news, um, you know, over the last couple of months, especially in the U S is, you know, different projects, different coins continuously getting dinged, um, getting shut down. Or, you know, deemed and put out, you know, kind of suits against them being securities. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually something that, you know, we've seen as being a, you know, an absolute um, eventually happening item. So that's kind of where the emergence of, of the other project, Soma Finance, has come out. Mm-hmm. Um, so just kind of giving a bit of a background. So Soma Finance is actually a, a 50-50 joint venture between Montreal and a U.S. licensed broker dealer called Tritorian Capital, which is actually based out of uh, New York. Right. Um, so just, you know, somewhere, somewhere behind you. <laughs> yeah, it's kind um, of a TradFi player, right? Like they're, they're... <laughs> Exactly. So it's, They don't you know, call what, themselves what TradFi, but... <laughs> D- <laughs> DeFi to tra- TradFi or TradFi to DeFi. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> kind of making, making that merge and making that bridge. Right. Um, but, you know, kind of what, where that came about is it's a, you know, it's a startup right now that's been worked on, um, you know, with the current team for the past, you know, five or six years. Mm. Um, so actually myself and, you know, one of my co-founders here at Montreal, John, we've actually been working with the two guys, Jim and Bill, who've been running the broker dealer for the last, uh, you know, 20 plus years. We met them back in uh, 2016, 2017, when we had actually started a uh, crypto exchange uh, back during kind of the first ICO boom. Right. Um, and during the time, you know, we had always wanted to have it be a, you know, fully licensed, fully compliant multi-asset exchange. So starting with cryptos, but then utilizing our license to then, you know, incorporate public equities and Forex and, you know, anything kind of under the sun. Yeah. Um, unfortunately that company didn't end up panning out with kind of the, uh, the crypto winter that happened. Um, but the silver lining of that was, you know, besides meeting the, our two partners over there, who are the other co-founders for, for Soma Finance now, um, is we actually started a dialogue with the SEC and FINRA in the U.S. back in 2017 and went, you know, hey, we have this traditional broker dealer license that allows us to deal with securities. Can we start working with and issuing securities on the blockchain? Right. Um, they go, you know, absolutely not. It's totally different. Don't you dare do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so pretty much what, what happened is that started, a you know, two, two and a half year saga of a back and forth with the SEC and FINRA and those regulators that, you know, eventually led to fast forward to 2019, us actually receiving an additional license on top of our broker dealer to be able to compliantly and legally issue and work with tokenized securities. So pretty mm-hmm. much any asset on any blockchain using any reg filing. Um, So right now, this is, you know, a totally unique license. Um, It's something that, you know, we believe that we're the only ones that have it in the full breadth. Uh, We've seen, you know, a few others, but they've been very um, niche or filtered down where they can only do something like a reg D offering, which is to accredited investors using, you know, a permission chain. Um, Whereas the one we have, we can use any blockchain and, you know, we can use, uh, you know, reg D, reg S, reg CF, reg A plus, which in terms of just quickly, you know, letting you guys know what those are, because for most people, yeah, most you know, people don't know the differences between those <laughs> yeah. things. Yeah. So, so a Reg D offering is to accredited investors. That means, you know, in the U.S. people that uh, have, I think, earn over two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, or have you know a million dollars in terms of liquid assets. Yeah, on the um, theory that they can they can absorb uh, any trading gain or trading loss, and they are. Better investors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And they're, yeah, knowledgeable investors and, you know, know how to do due diligence. Um, So then there's a a Reg S, which is uh, for international uh, retail. Uh, So allowing us to to raise funds from, you know, uh, non-U.S. peoples um, that, you know, are both accredited and non-accredited. There's Reg A Plus, which is pretty much like a mini IPO. 
then the really interesting one for the U.S. that we're super excited about is a Reg CF, which is the U.S. crowdfunding license. Mm. So this means that we can actually issue tokens, and you know, now within the U.S. under the guise of the SEC, everything's going to be a security, pretty much. You know, most all all tokens are going to be securities. Ninety percent of NFTs, in-game assets, tradables, skins are going to be securities. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to actually be able to access the U.S. market on you know, the initial issuance, you have to go through a reg a reg CF offering. Um, so right. this actually will allow U.S. retail for the first time ever within crypto to participate legally in a initial token offering. Um, you know, in the past, if you, if you know U.S. person is trading a token, you know, let's say on Coinbase or one of the other centralized exchanges, most of the time it's already been live for six months and it's already seen its you know massive growth potential. So mm-hmm. this really allows U.S. retail to actually be able to participate and get access to, you know, where a lot of the growth really lies, which is in, you know, the initial raise and kind of the seed rounds and this kind of stuff. Um, so that's, you know, really, really exciting. And, you know, what happened with that is when we received the license in 2019, we went out and actually did a kind of a cornerstone deal to do, you know, proof of concept and then proof of license. Um, mm-hmm. So we actually ended up doing the deal with the NBA player called Spencer Dinwiddie. Um, right. Back in you know 2019 2020 when he was still um, with the Nets was, right exactly so he was yeah. with the Brooklyn Nets so again playing, <laughs> right, playing right, right, right where you are <laughs> yes now he's with the uh, the Dallas Mavericks right yes um, he did he played so pretty with, well in in the round you know he he, he had a good, pretty good game if good. He's, like I, I mean, still remember some, him because he's a amazing game. Yeah, he's like, you know, this is a true believer. Like, you know, I'll, I'll support him no matter, you know, wh- wh- which team he plays, plays for, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, yeah, he always, you know, he says he's a, you know, he's a techie with a jump shot or, you know, investor with a jump shot, mm. something like that, which is great. Nice. I mean, he's, he's definitely at the forefront. Um, and it was, you know, really, you know, fun and, and interesting kind of use case to put out where we tokenize a bit of his sports contract. Um, but, you know, what happened is he tried doing with a couple other broker dealers without the license. Um, and because it was such a, a public deal, they ended up getting uh, stopped uh, by the regulators before it ever began. But then mm-hmm. we ended up doing it. Uh, we were able to su- successfully issue the token, um, you know, audited by by FINRA, every department, you know, pass all of those because, you know, one, we have the license and two, you know, we, we do these deals right. Um, we know, you know, right. exactly how to structure them and we play by the by the book. Was that an um, unfortunately... Ethereum token uh, when you guys? Yeah, exactly. So that was planning? that was an Ethereum token. Um, it was, it was just a, it was a reg D offering. So it was only to accredited investors. Um, so that one, you know, again, was just kind of testing out the, uh, you know, how everything works and kind of building the playbook. Um, of course, at the end of that deal, then COVID happened. Um, so, you know, everything kind of was put on a, on a halt, but, you know, luckily that was actually worked in our favor, um, as it allowed, you know, John and myself to link up with, you know, the co-founder for Montreal, uh, Rodrigo launch Montredao, you know, pretty much build this, you know, in turn, this dev studio, build us a, a suite of smart contracts um, that eventually we came back to them. And this was, you know, with the emergence of DeFi and, um, and said, you know, what if we took all these amazing smart contracts and DeFi services and ingenuities, but made them compliant and accessible in the US. So put a KYC right. AML wrapper around those. Yes. Um, and, you know, allowed both institutions as well as retail people in the US as well as globally to access these things in a safe and, you know, transparent manner. And, you know, in the US, you know, insured and all of this. Um, so, you know, looking at like the deck side of things, um, you know, being able to have both crypto assets as well as public equities. Um, so, you know, again, like a proper, um, you know, use case for people that wanted to have access to you know, tokenized equities was looking at like synthetics or mirror protocol, you know, it saw, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars going on there and, and trading and participating within those markets, but they're all synthetics. They didn't actually add up one to one. Whereas with the licensing that we have, everything's one to one backed. So if you hold a, you know, a, a Soma Tesla share on the platform, you still get dividends. You still have proxy voting rights. Same thing as you would on your, you know, Schwab or, or E-Trade account. Yeah, the blockchain um, is so, just a database, a record, same mm-hmm. as a you know a, a database of uh, of the clearinghouse, whatever it might be, that's uh, custody in the, the asset. Absolutely, yeah, and it and it takes away you know a lot of the kind of the pain points of what we've seen with centralized exchanges. You know, it takes away you know wash trading, takes away order book manipulation, you know any of these parts. So it really does, and also it, you know with the kind of liquidity pool model, 
it allows both retail people and institutions to be able to take part within the liquidity pool, earning the trading fees instead mm -hmm. of just the, the centralized um, exchange taking those fees. And, right. you know, so the experience, earning from. So the experience for a person who, let's say, a pass through KYC if they're based in the mm. U.S., uh, would be a DEX-like experience. It's as if you're doing a uh, more regular DeFi transaction using your wallet, or is it something that requires a special DAB or uh, even a centralized mm. kind of like Coinbase app? So what is the mm. user experience for someone participating in that way? Absolutely. So, you know, coming onto it, you still have to, you know, you need to go through a KYC process. So same as you're signing up for, you know, any a bank or a centralized mm -hmm. exchange or, you know, realistically, a, an e-commerce site even. Um, so once you go through that and you're approved by, you know, one of the compliance officers, then it's it's more of a, you know, kind of one of the current DeFi dApps. So it's still it's non-custodial. You know, we don't hold anyone's funds. Um, so, you, you know, you connect with your, your MetaMask um, or, you know, one of your Web3 wallets, and then it's interacting like you would with, uh, you know, Uniswap. Mm -hmm. But instead, you know, there's, you know, you don't have to worry about the counterparty risk because everyone's been KYC to get on there. Um, so you're trading against, you know, real people that we verify. So it'll be the DEX aspect, and then we'll have the, um, the issuance side. So, you know, allow people to invest in those kind of new issued tokens. And then of course, after that, then, the, you know, those tokens will go on the decks so that they can be traded. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the other kind of main features that we'll, we'll look to launch with um, towards the end of the year is also kind of yield bearing uh, services and earn features. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we've, we've seen there's huge demand in the US for those kind of features as led by, you know, some of the big players um, in the space. Um, a lot of which have now been, you know, they've, they've shut down those operations um, or they've been fine because ultimately they didn't have the licensing to actually use those. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we're able to actually launch those legally and compliantly so that people can actually access yield bearing um, services and accounts for their different assets. Right. So that's what pretty much here? like the, the roadmap. This is what you're saying mm -hmm. is that you can do compliant DeFi by centering the compliance part up front, and then the mm -hmm. DeFi and maybe you know similar tools, but it would be it's not Uniswap that I'm doing this. In. This mm -hmm. is your kind of like variants of that kind of AM uh, automatic market maker style, and and yeah. everybody who is interacting with that is going has gone through that same compliance process. Exactly. So you know, just getting you know, I, I like calling it the band aid approach. So you know, mm -hmm. just go through the KYC process, add your information, then once you're in, you're passported. I see. Um, and this is you know, it's, it's cool because it's not just like in, currently in the U.S. If you want to access some of the brokerage accounts for U.S. public equities, you have to be a U.S. citizen. So it's very mm -hmm. difficult for people in you know in Asia or in Europe or anywhere in the world to be able to access some of these things. Um, and that's not even mentioning the, you know, maybe the price of one share is a couple hundred bucks, which that also is, you know, out of some people's reach. Yes. This will allow, because it's a, you know, global platform, you know, if you're someone in the Philippines or um, someone in, in Africa or Latin America or Europe or, you know, again, anywhere um, that's not, you know, of course, an OFAC listed country um, can come on and be able to, you know, sell their ETH or sell their USDC for, uh, you know, Apple or Google or Tesla share. Um, so really being able to, to, to hedge and, you know, build a, uh, a pretty diverse portfolio outside of, you know, what they already have on the other side of it, you know, to allow people that, you know, they might have a traditional brokerage account, you know, eventually you'll be able to actually move those shares from, from your brokerage account onto the Soma finance platform. And, you know, if you if your entire portfolio is in equities, maybe you want to actually take some, um, you know, get some crypto in there. So again, mm -hmm. kind of connecting the two worlds in a place that it's easy to um, to access and, and easy to use. Because yeah. again, you know, like like we said when we first started talking, again, the user experience, the UI UX, these are all crucial things, especially as we start going into, you know, this new territory of you know what you know, the finance or capital ecosystem 2.0 is going to look like with a truly global marketplace and people that you know aren't necessarily in crypto right now but want to be able to take part. Yeah, it's very kind of interesting when there was a, when we first started, you know, for example, playing around with things like Make a, Make a DAO, the mm -hmm. first organization with a DAO, you know, creating that, you know, that position using their UI was really confusing, right? Like, how do you even do that? That was, a, and that was the best tool that was available. And mm -hmm. as of today, if you look at Uniswap, sorry, that these things are easier to use than my, mm -hmm you know, brokerage account in a traditional institution, right? TD Ameritrade yeah. is all right, that has good UI, but, you know, I think Dexas has really moved 
beyond that in terms of uh, the quality. So it's, I think DeFi is going to lead the way, especially with the iteration speed and the and the kind of uh, fork and improve, fork and improve. You're seeing mm -hmm. more opportunity there. With these kind of like user interface improvement that can be mm -hmm. kind of like shared and, and, the, and the community move forward together, what kind of new uh, kind of things that, for example, that income share contract from Spencer Din Dinwiddie, uh, mm -hmm. I do see new Rec CF crowdfunding type of vehicle show up. Do you think that with that kind of regulatory umbrella that you would mm -hmm. either personally work on something that is like, don't you wish you can actually sell artist royalties in this way that has an income stream with it? Uh, or can, can we actually sell income performing, you know, real estate, like a read on this? Like, are, are these ideas you're playing around with? And, and, and what do you think the, the appetite for, for these kind of real cash flow generating things, which hopefully answer the way as a sustainable yield coming from question that I think we all have in our mind with the DeFi 2.0 collapse. Uh, what's your thoughts on these type, new type of income generating with his NFT yeah. tokens. No, I think, you know, you, you definitely nail on the head with, um, with that, you know, one of the big things that we're looking at on the issuance side and some of the, you know, the first ones that we'll actually be launching within the, the Soma finance platform and ecosystem will be just that, you know, looking at, you know, different structures and different revenue streams for traditional, uh, you know, traditionally or historically, illiquid or untouchable markets. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you know, if you're looking at sports athletes, you know, being able to, um, you know, invest in, in some of their future earnings or future growth. If you're, you know, if you're a recording artist, being able to actually issue, you know, an NFT or a token or, you know, some sort of structure that, you know, you can raise your funds for your next album. And then, you know, by holding that NFT or holding, you know, those tokens, you earn royalties. Um, you right. know, you're, you're getting access to, um, some of the first drops of the songs, um, you know, you're getting access to um, the distribution, the concerts, you know, it, it really can be a full 360 ecosystem, yeah. which you couldn't do before, because, you know, a lot of people have talked about, you know, having royalties or things that, you know, can give off, um, you know, streams of, of revenue or streams of income. But of course, mm -hmm. that, you know, that crosses the line into what a security is. Yes, um, and, and it, and it allows, allows, and it is really hard to define exactly what a royalty is. But if you were to mm -hmm. really think of yourself as having kind of the creator token, right, the token of mm -hmm. this artist, the David Bowie t bond, Bowie bonds, mm -hmm. or the like, you actually feel like you know, if he does a concert, or if he fly to mm -hmm. uh, the Middle Eastern country and do a show, that counts too, right? Like that, that yeah. could be a very interesting thing. And and we see, uh, for example, there's a lot of interest. You know, I have I'm on the board of a music tech uh, com company with a blockchain kind of angle. Uh, there's a lot of people in private equity want to buy these kind of music catalog for that reliable mm -hmm. cash flow. But again, yeah. unless you can put you know, a hundred billion dollars on the table, nobody's going to talk to you. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, uh, you know, I, you know, even just talking about the music catalog, you know, I saw like Justin Timberlake um, recently sold for, you know, a like hundred million dollars, his, you know, a lot of his um, songs, something like this. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, being able to actually, you know, instead of one, you know, big company or one um, big fund, you know, purchasing that, being able to actually offer that to retail people around the world, you know, his true fan base that, you know, want to, want to purchase and want to own, you know, a piece of the catalog or a piece of a song that, you know, it's actually able to receive royalties on it. Right. Um, so that's going to be, you know, a, a major thing. And, you know, there've been a number of, you know, athletes and, and, you know, potentially sports teams or leagues trying to do things, but this, you know, hasn't necessarily been done just right in terms of kind of looking at the, the longer term as well as, you know, they've kind of wanted to skirt around it actually being a security. Right. Um, so there are some, you know, there are some platforms that, you know, work with like the, the Champions League, for instance. Um, but in terms of like what the token does, because it's, you know, quote unquote, not a security, all it does is really allow people to maybe like pick the, the color of the socks or pick the, you know, the color of the jerseys or the songs they come out, out to, which, mm -hmm. you know, that's cool for maybe one or two times. But it's not actually really promoting the fan base. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if you're actually able to register at a security, you know, you could have teams that sell, you know, 1% of their sports team um, and, you know, really get, you know, fan user engagement because they feel like they're, you know, because they are a part owner. You can have yes. it where, you know, it accesses um, special nights or, you know, on the field kind of um, on the field access. 
And then also in terms of like, you know, if they end up winning, you know, in baseball, like a World Series or, you know, something like this, that they can actually have, you know, a piece of what the revenue stream would come into. Um, So it really does like it opens up the entire world in terms of, you know, what you're able to do that in the past, it's been very much so closed off and only for a select couple people or a couple funds. Um, So really making, you know, a lot of this a global, you know, community that can access. So that's, you know, one of one of the big things. And like, to be honest, a big focus to start will be with just that. So it'll be with athletes. Um, You know, it'll be with musicians. It'll be with, um, you know, people in the entertainment space that are looking, you know, that one have big fan bases. So that again, that's a big migration of getting people into Web3. But but in a meaningful way, not just, you know, owning a picture of them as an NFT. Well, what's interesting about NFTs that people forgot that, like you know, when we talk about DEXs, Uniswap, mm. the the you know LP position was a token, mm. ELC twenty mm. in version two, and it's an yeah. NFT in version three. Like <laughs> people don't know how to evaluate them. Nobody bids on mm. that stuff. They do get automatically listed on OpenSea. But this idea that this NFT box set comes with, if that's you know done correctly, right, compliantly, mm-hmm. um, yep. ten, 1% of the ticket sales on the t-shirts of mm-hmm. this design is pretty cool, right? Like, and it can happen. It can totally happen. Like, you actually yep. could be the design of this t-shirt ties to this cultural thing. That's why mm-hmm. I'm actually quite interested in the intersection between the kind of revenue generating aspects of these mm-hmm. rich CF vehicle, but an NFT in the wrapper. So it's a box yep. set that yeah. has a contract in it <laughs> like i think mm-hmm. that may actually like tie in those two things and the composability we talk mm-hmm. about in abstract can actually be true this is an yeah. entity with a dividend in it mm-hmm. yeah no absolutely and i think that you know tying the the nfts into it too is just going to you know further increase the engagement and you know people's desire and then also you know as they start to learn about it then they can start learning about you know what royalties are and, and these different revenue streams. And that's when it really gets interesting. Yeah. And I that's mean, the, it... you know, the, the big, the big thing right now is, is a lot of just education. You know, a lot of people have these amazing ideas um, and, you know, a lot of them, you know, might be well-funded. It's a matter of, you know, in the U S it's, you can get something out quickly, but you'll always worry that, you know, the SEC yeah, might yeah, come yeah. down, you might get, you know, shut down. And again, this even goes for, you know, things like charities, you know, if you're looking to start a, you know, a charity or, you know, something that gives back based around an NFT or a token, like that's amazing. You know, you shouldn't have to worry about, um, you know, regulators shutting you down because ultimately what you're doing is, is trying to help people and help organizations and, you know, solve what problem that you're focusing on. Mm-hmm. But having said that, you know, if you're raising funds and it's something that, you know, is distributing capital, then, you know, it needs to just be done right. So right now it's, you know, talking with different organizations, um, you know, whether you're a Fortune 500 or a, you know, uh, entertainment uh, celebrity or just, you know, someone that's, you know, looking to build, you know, this amazing business is, you know, yes, you can go out and do it quickly um, and always, you know, try to convince yourself and convince someone that it's a utility, but why not just, you know, call a spade a spade, come out, issue it as a security, Mm -hmm. which then opens up the entire, you know, realm of possibilities in terms of what those tokens, those NFTs can do. Yeah. Um, and you don't always have to work, you know, you can focus on what you're good at, which is building that business, whatever it might be. Whereas and ascribing we can it with cultural value, part. right? Like you, the, yeah. the part of actually engaging and say, this thing is something I want versus something mm-hmm. that I can have. Uh, in is, yeah. uh, it's something that still needs to be done. It's interesting to see that, like, you know, to be able to make that bridge between the regulations, uh, especially in the U.S., where there's still emerging a consensus, if there is even emerging a consensus, what it ought to be. And I'm I'm pretty happy that our senator in New York, uh, Jillian Brand, was, you know, have part in kind of proposing this new Mm -hmm. CFTC uh, type of uh, approach, at least in some of the more uh, kind of uh, auxiliary assets that Mm -hmm. like ETH can be arguably can be classified as such uh, with adequate decentralization. And I'm glad that that conversation with the lobbying and with the kind of uh, advocating uh, from different companies and projects are happening. But one thing that is interesting to me, and I want to kind of come back to the concept of DAOs and running a DAO, Mm -hmm. is that, you know, to do these compliant things, you need a centralized entity with a license. Mm-hmm. And to truly tap in the possibility space of what can be possible, you have to tap into wisdom to a crowd with the community. How do you reconcile the, 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 the idea generation and the kind of distributed work nature of a DAO with mm-hmm. the 
important but somewhat centralized nature of being uh, kind of having that bridge to this one place, which is the compliant mm -hmm. issuance of, let's say, uh, crowdfunding tokens. Yeah, so, you know, I think taking even a step back with any company, especially in the crypto space where it really is, you know, it's sentiment driven, it's retail driven, it's about communities, whether you're a DAO or not, and this is kind of the opinion that we've had for anything that we've ever worked on or launched, the community always comes first. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, yeah. yes, you know, we're not the ones that are using, well, yes, we are using it on a daily basis, but we're not the ones that we're necessarily building this for. We'll be, we're building it for the community that's actually using it. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be an ongoing conversation and an open conversation, again, regardless of if you're a DAO or not, in terms of, you know, the direction of the company, because those are your end users and those are the ones that are going to you know, go promote it to others. They're going to help growth um, and they're going to help, you know, letting you know if something works or doesn't work um, and, you know, kind of giving this constant feedback loop. So, you know, that's kind of been the approach that, you know, we've always taken. Um, now with with DAOs in particular, you know, it's one, not everyone needs to be a DAO. Um, two, it's, you know, it is very difficult to get a DAO started. Mm. Um, because, you know, regardless when you're starting something, there always needs to be some sort of level of centralization, at least to begin with. You know, yes. you need that team that puts it together, that structures it, that releases the initial, um, you know, platform or releases the, you know, initial services. Um, as well as, you know, kind of builds the roadmap to get it to where a DAO could be. So, you know, I think it's personally very difficult to have a DAO, a DAO be a properly, you know, on-chain executable um, operating from day one. Mm -hmm. It's something that, you know, it, it takes some time, but it's, of course, you know, it's something very possible. Um, so like with, with Mantra DAO, for instance, you know, one of the, the services that we've pretty much set up are ripe for you know being able to be run as a as a DAO. Um, so you know for for the longest time and you know up till this point, it's still been you know what we've called soft governance. Um, so you know using on chain proposals, on chain voting um, to be able to you know gauge what the community wants to do. But we still have kind of the internal council that you know decides you know what actually gets passed. Um, mm -hmm. But you know with them kind of being at the middle of of the the decision making process. Um, but eventually, you know, kind of as we build what we call is like the, you know, smart contract factory in the back end, you know, things like staking. So staking pools, you know, should be a, a very easy one for, you know, us. And that'll be one of the first things I think that, you know, we'll have, you know, on the fully executable, you know, DAO side is, you know, if you like a project, you can, you know, make a proposal for a new staking pool, whether it's single asset or, you know, an LP um, to, you know, be spun up. And if, you know, the community wants it, then, you know, that smart contract can automatically be um, be spun up and then you know the tokens would then be you know for that specific project would be distributed into that smart contract right. you yeah. know same thing with you know with the you know zen trust our money market you know being able for people to vote on you know potentially what the ltv you know loan to value ratios right, right. are what assets they would want to see on it um uh same thing with the launch pad you know people to be able to vote you know what assets they want to see launched, which they want to participate in, and what the different tiers of you know investing or you know participation level they want to um, uh, be able to offer. So again, like these kind of DeFi services are no brainers for for how to you know properly have a, a fully executable DAO. Right, and um, it's, it, there was this article uh, from <clears throat> the from the founders of the Pods project, uh, which is like a <clears throat> governance thing, and they talk about trustware and socialware. And socialware is you need coordinations and maybe the soft governance you talked about. Trustware <clears throat> is the vending machine. There are certain <clears throat> types of retail transaction that if you just put coins in or you know do your Apple Pay thing, you get. Coca-Cola in your hand, right? So there are certain types of mechanics that can be simplified, whether that's listing a token or setting a rate that that absolutely should take the human, even the coordination out of it. And that creates more trust, trustless or trust, depends on how you look at it. But there are still going to be some soft governance on like, what color is the logo is very hard to completely automate, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys have the coolest roadmap, by the way. I don't know who came up with that decision <laughs> so of much. climbing the ascensions of the mountain and the fork on the road and emerging together. It's like, I can only imagine the uh, four hour Netflix documentary of like people climbing and like, and using that as the infographic to tie your documentary together. I can, I can feel the energy. That was fantastic. <laughs> the best you. one I 
that I've was seen, a lot of fun making that. <laughs> uh, that's the best I've seen in the field. So kudos to you, you and your team. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's um you know it's been really exciting building this. Um, you know, all all parts of it. We have a, a really amazing team um, in house as well as partners that we work with, pretty much across the board. And and that's actually so you know looking at kind of that you know vending machine in terms of DAOs or just looking at you know being able to properly tool DAOs to to mm-hmm. become what they want to become. So that's mm-hmm. actually a big focus as we're kind of moving into this next phase of Mantra DAO and moving past just you know kind of the suite of DeFi products on you know ETH, BSC, Polygon, um, and building out you know a much more robust ecosystem. Is we are starting to look at more kind of DAO as a service. Mm-hmm. Um, DAO infrastructures and DAO tooling. So we're actually in the process of building the first DAO and first DEX on Hedera. Um, mm-hmm. So this is through a grant from the Hedera Foundation. Um, and this will be something that, you know, again, if we can you know, kind of mimic what we've done in terms of Mantra DAO, being able to create, you know, a DEX um, that ties in with, you know, both the Mantra DAO ecosystem, but of course with the, you know, Hedera ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, and, a, you know, a DAO that will actually end up, you know, running that in terms of, you know, the pools and, and then, you know, any of the different DeFi products after that. Um, same thing, you know, within the Polkadot ecosystem, um, you know, building on, on one of their parachains, um, a star and trying to bring one of the first money markets into that ecosystem and DAOs into that ecosystem. Right. Um, so that's kind of a, a big thing we see is, and, and besides just the DeFi side, you know, looking at um, DAO treasury management, um, uh, you know, DAO uh, HR or, you know, employment, um, you know, any of these number of things that, you know, again, if you, it's if you're building a business, you still need to keep in mind that there's a lot more that goes into it that, again, is very back office. But yeah, absolutely. You know, em- employment contracts and salary, you know, again, those can be those are super easy to put on a uh, into a smart contract and, you know, yes. people to vote who should, you know, take over what role. Um, and then same thing, I mean, treasury management is a big part, especially, you know, people that are new in the space, meaning since kind of the, the last two years, yeah. they've now, you know, recently learned with the, you know, the recent downturn that treasury management is absolutely crucial, um, mm-hmm. because, you know, again, it is a volatile market. So you need to be able to, you know, do such in a, in a, um, you know, hedged and, and smart mm-hmm. manner. Um, and and so, it's also you know, risk management, right? Risk management, mm-hmm, yeah. you know, an ETH with a prefix. Well, it depends what the prefix <laughs> is, right? Like yeah. it, it's, it could be of a very diverse uh, degree of risk uh, on mm-hmm. it, locking and STETH and stuff like that. that. That changes what you can do and what type of vehicle it is, even though the price technically for mm. now is the price you see but uh but you got to price it in. and then and it ha- applies to bridging as well like on which yeah. chain uh what mm. kind of liquidity what kind of exit liquidity what kind of bridging liquidity mm. what is your is there a limit to how much you can withdraw yeah. uh and these mm. are all things that i think think that the people who are uh, working in treasury management in the DeFi things just ha- doesn't mm. happen you ask any treasury management person that's worked in a mm. multinational there's like really that's like basic. That's what I fir- <laughs> learned in my first year when I got on MBA, right? Like, so it, totally different. They're, they're trying to move money mm-hmm. from the island bank account from Apple, mm-hmm. you know. But but the you know treating countries as chains and currency as risks and vehicles mm-hmm. and commercial papers in different country with stability. These are really treasury management as a practice in the more traditional mm-hmm. enterprise space. And I think those yeah. talent, uh, I, I just think. Th- that they, they should come to Web3 and learn a little bit about our tools and then give us their knowledge about how to do this in a, in a kind of balanced and so efficient way so yeah. that, you know, treasury management is largely so that the company's CEO and executive, they want to do something, buy a company, open a factory, they can, right? Uh, but yeah. but to do that in a risk, not risk-free, but risk-managed way is definitely something mm. we need to learn as an industry. Absolutely. And yeah, so that's, I mean, you know, one of the big things is if we can help to build some of that, um, you know, again, with with either other teams or, you know, with individuals from the traditional side, they can help to bring some of that know-how and knowledge mm-hmm. um, into it. So being able to kind of have those toolings. So, you know, again, if you're if you're a gamer, if you're a marketing person, if you're a you know developer, that's not the first thing you know, nor do you even know how to mm-hmm. go about that. So if we can actually help to provide some of the infrastructure for that, um, then that's the best way possible because then it actually helps to, you know, continue creating, um, you know, well-run and, and and proper DAOs, you know, going forward, which we don't see as slowing down anytime soon. 
Not at all. I think the proliferation and professionalization is both going to happen at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the industry has gone, gone a, come a long way in the what, eight years I've been in this field. And the one mm -hmm. thing that, 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 that I keep looking at is that there are a lot of skill sets and know-how from the kind of traditional Web 2 or even Web 1 space that mm -hmm. uh, requires some, you know, thing. Yes, a gamer know how to do resource management uh, mm -hmm. of, of StarCraft. Or, uh, but, <laughs> but do you know how to do enterprise resource planning, ERP, mm -hmm. like accounting and planning and forecasting? So there, yeah. there, there's definitely things on it. And, you know, we, we, we be, we're working on a uh, UI generator for a lot of these front ends. And, you know, most mm -hmm. enterprise apps are not custom crafted like consumer mm -hmm. app. There's a template, there's schemers, there's like, account receivable and payables tables and the database that generates all that stuff. So we're doing that stuff so that we can reduce the cost of creating the DAP and then mm -hmm. adapting those common UI and common forms to different smart contracts. Some that's written in the language of Rust uh, for Polkadot and in the language of EVM and Solidity for that, but sharing an interface, sharing a way to compose it. So we're doing UI's composability right now, which is not a super easy thing to do. So we've, we're mm -hmm. JavaScript experts working on, you know, what does it mean to generate the UI? Uh, the same yeah. we can generate NFT contracts uh, for the front end that can actually allow us to do multi-chain interaction behind the facade of this common UI. Uh, so I would love to, you know, have an opportunity maybe to show some of the work to you. And maybe as would you guys said, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, shipping <laughs> up employment agreement templates in two chains, Hadara and, and Polkadot, maybe we can put a cost stack UI in front in common mm -hmm. between them. And and the smart yeah, contract that, needs that, to be written amazing. and we can generate that, right? That that yeah. requires a level of care that, you know, a smart contract studio like yours have to take on because the, the risks are all different. Right. Mm -hmm. You yeah. don't want to generate a smart contract. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, no, I mean, that, you know, that's exactly working, you know, working with other, you know, other projects, working with other teams is exactly the, you know, kind of the, the way forward that we see with it. Yeah. Um, cause, cause everyone, you know, everyone's working on, you know, different, different part of, you know, what kind of goes into a DAO and kind of these different automated pieces that, you know, are going to greatly help the industry just overall by allowing the toolings. I mean, again, even looking at, you know, what Ethereum did, you know, Ethereum made it really easy for people to build on top of it. Yes. So this is the same thing, you know, as more people will, you know, see the the upside of what DAOs can solve and, and how DAOs can be run. If we yeah. can provide the right tooling, you know, whether it's coming from us or coming from, you know, in partnership with someone else, then that's the best thing possible for the space, you know, as a whole. So, you know, when you look at Web3 and, 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 you know, mm -hmm. obviously DAOs and DeFi's and NFT and the traditional crypto and maybe even some of the new GameFi stuff that's coming on uh, mm -hmm. is, is part of this Web3 moniker. And we use the Web3 uh, as a general term for describing, you know, the, the topics we've discussed today. Is there a particular missing piece in the, whether it's a technology stack or in the product suite that you think are... Uh, 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 kind of that you would, if you can snap a finger Thanos style, can make appear uh, or, or make disappear. Uh, is there a thing that you can wish into being that would, you think, unlock the true value of Web3 and bring it closer and faster to the market? That's a, I mean, it's a great question. There's, I mean, probably a number of things, you know, either that we're seeing internally. I mean, the, you know, the biggest not so snappable piece of everything is just is the education part. Mm -hmm. So you know, the, the biggest barrier and, and hurdle for people getting into web three is just them learning about what web three is. Yeah. Um, having said that, you know, I think there are a lot of good solutions emerging, you know, they probably need a, a bit more time, but being able to have, um, you know, different wallets and accounts created through social logins. So mm -hmm. instead of be having to go and you know, save a save a private key and, and take care of that, you know, being able to actually create a, a wallet where the private key is sharded over a couple of different, <coughs> excuse me, chains, um, so that they can then, you know, actually be able to access this without, you know, going through the hassle. Again, it's not, you know, setting up a MetaMask isn't necessarily a difficult thing, but having said that, you know, there's a lot of people that it's tough and, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a daunting thing. So I think one, just the accessibility into it, you know, being mm. able for, for people to kind of set up accounts in an easy way um, is, is, you know, a big piece of it. The, I mean, the cross chain aspects of everything, you know, you mentioned bridges before bridges are yes. a whole other animal on its own. Um, there's, yes. you know, a lot of risk and realistically, you know, as, as history will tell, it's, you know, most of the big kind of losses within the space have been on attacks on bridges. Um, 
and funds being lost there. So in terms of, you know, properly interacting with, with different chains and how those tokens are stored and, and mapped on those chains, I think that, you know, still has, has a bit of a ways to go. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for us, us even, you know, one of the things in terms of the, you know, kind of the, the validator node businesses, of course, those are all different POS chains, uh, whether mm-hmm. they're, you know, EVM or, or Tendermint or, um, you know, whichever, whichever other ecosystem, uh, being able to actually have inter, you know, integrated interfaces so that you can actually access, you know, all of those at once. Um, because yeah. it, it's still, you know, a bit jumbled in terms of pieces do still exist within their silos. So you have to go to one platform in order to, you know, to integrate with, uh, you know, anything Cosmos, you know, ecosystem, another one for, for Polkadot and, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think that's still, you know, that's definitely something that if there was a solution for that immediately, you know, amazing. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. I, you know, having said that, I don't think we are, are too far off in terms of having something to be able to, uh, to, you know, progress that forward. Yeah, I think operationally operating in different chain is like before there was standardization of plugs, the phones work differently, <laughs> the, the, the wall switches look differently, and then you just have to like, oh, I'm in this country, what what am I going to do with that? And, yeah. and then, you know, I think the EU, for example, is like, everything is USB-C. So maybe we'll come, that, yeah. a, <laughs> we'll come up with a, we'll come up with a USB C for crypto uh, plugs. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> for PSA. <laughs> uh, I would love to have that. And I mean, I, I, I saw the, the, uh, the, the Intel Nook people are selling these nooks and each one is a mm-hmm. POC to me that's like a physical Lego block like if I have a little mm-hmm. shelf I just put all the nodes next to each other and then maybe at least they look <laughs> the same uh, but I don't yeah. think that's what you're talking about I think you're talking about more than just the plugs and the ping right and, and the network cable yeah, yeah I, I, I can't imagine what does it mean uh, to like operate all this simultaneous infrastructure uh, mm-hmm. some of them even have slashing in it you don't really want to get into that right yeah exactly <laughs> So yeah, there's, there's a lot more that goes into, into kind of the DevOps side of, of running nodes that, uh, that people don't see, but you know, that's, it's a big part, you know, when you have slashing and people can actually lose money due to, you know, negligence or carelessness. Uh, usually you know, carelessness so i i think malicious, usually carelessness. <laughs> like malicious losing funds on staking because there's no return is mostly stupidity so yeah. <laughs> like there, there are ways to get into trouble but there's also a huge upside if you do that right so there's really not not a whole lot of upside running a node badly right like nobody would choose yeah. that as their as their alpha uh, there's yeah. none there just <laughs> well it's yeah ex- ex- exactly it's 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 just something that uh you know people need to to keep an eye on because you know, whether they mean to or not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you know, unfortunately, it's a thing that happens, you know, pretty frequently, just for yeah, those yeah. that, you know, take it a bit too carelessly. Yeah, so, so it's good, I think, to, to offer that as a service, I think some of the most successful kind of mm-hmm. uh, uh, centralized players are thinking about is like, well, this is a hard problem, let's solve it once, put a facade mm-hmm. over it. Uh, but I, I think the more we can improve the tooling from the from the kind of ecosystem and the different type of uh, uh, then then more people can participate without having to hire a 400 yeah. person devops team yeah yeah <laughs> and that's i mean that, that's what we're seeing <laughs> that's what we're seeing you know big time too as we as we now move it from you know what it's been in the past which is definitely more retail to more institutional yeah so starting to work with um, you know banks hedge funds family offices um, and different firms that, you know, again, they want to be able to offer these, these different, um, kind of staking abilities to their, their high net wealth, their clients, you know, the people within their ecosystem, but, you know, they have no idea about running a validator node for, you know, some proof of stake chain. Um, they don't even know what the proof of stake chain is, but they know that, you know, there's enough liquidity. It's, it's, you know, a strong enough network, um, that, you know, it should be something that, that there's interest. So being able to actually provide that infrastructure for them is a, a big thing we're focusing on. Um, yeah. Because we already have, you know, the data centers, we have the tech stack, we have the DevOps, yeah, yeah. you know, um, people. So being able to, you know, scale that for different clients, uh, again, will will allow, you know, more people to get into their, you know, at least get their, their feet wet in yeah, terms absolutely. of the ecosystem by having some exposure to crypto through, you know, them staking, you know, this POS right. asset. And that's on, a participation. That's an active participation, which is which is substantial mm-hmm. and useful and necessary for the type of security and, and, yeah. and decentralized central to do. And of course, if they need a qualified custodian, you know, uh, you know, the people can go get one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's good. 
Uh, yeah. Well, this is such a fantastic conversation. I've learned so much from you, and hopefully, uh, that that the, the project you're working on kind of achieve the goal of being able to exist, and then from once Appreciate it exists, that. achieve that uh, goal of being able to take a certain part of it and putting a vending machine. Mm -hmm. I think this idea of like <laughs> yeah. progressive decentralization, not just as this continuum of this hand waving gradient, but it's like you know, mm -hmm. making the thing, you need a team. That can come together, yeah. and we, as, you know, we subscribe to that notion. We have great engineers working on hard problems about software composability, and we're working on wallets. We're using Nosa Safe, which only works on EVMs, right? Uh, but we yeah. are thinking about this multi-sig and social sign-ons and uh, access control for who can spend how much. We're experimenting there using Nosa Safe because it works today. Mm -hmm. But the UI yep. we're building for it can be used if you're using another uh, chain that has a different type of multi-sig wallet or even mm -hmm. using multi-party computation that, that uses mm -hmm. key shards over multiple key providers, a new type of staking provider to do the same thing. Uh, but we are trying to just like, you know, use the EVM ecosystem to learn what the UI needs to be, tr mm -hmm. treat the UI well, and then hopefully extend that UI to the truly multi-chain and multi-protocol ecosystem that will happen underneath that facade of familiarity. But, you know, that's the amazing thing about things like ho Apple HomeKit. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I really like it. Like on my yeah. phone, I can control vendor products from like 15 different vendors. I don't. I only mm -hmm. have three, but I can imagine I <laughs> can buy all of them. Uh, and and it's really great to have that standardization. But you know, the work needs to be done on each of the protocols. But hopefully, the UI uh, can come together and that solves the onboarding that wallet problem, which is a huge problem today. Absolutely I agree with right. You. Yeah, and yeah. and it's also quite different uh, from institution uh, needing that compliance, from retail needing mm -hmm. that ease. Uh, but it seems like you're working on all of these at the same time. Absolutely. So yeah, I guess a, you don't a, sleep. A, a, a lot, a lot to be done, but uh, you know we have the the proper you know the teams in place and you know amazing colleagues that we're working with pretty much across the board. Um, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, there's you know, you get you get some sleep, but. Uh, but the, you know, the drive and, you know, everything that's happening in the space is, it moves fast, but it's also incredibly exciting. So it's a, uh, you know, we're really passionate about what we're building, both on the Montreal side, as well as the Soma Finance and, you know, kind of all the other, um, you know, portfolio and, and partnered projects working on. Yeah, so I, I look forward to seeing the roadmap grow. The mountain gets higher, and then <laughs> new, new Himalayas ranges <laughs> come in. And so, so, so I'm going to geographically observe <laughs> your your roadmap mountain. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you so cool. much for your time today. And uh, yep, and as so always, uh, we 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 love hearing from people who are building, not just the people who are promoting. And I think you know when we speak with passion about the work we're doing and the meaning of the work, uh, I I think you know this material. Uh, which have an audience today, but also hopefully an audience in the future when this mm -hmm. field is 10 times, 100 times the size, we can remind people, it's like, hey, we told you so. This is, <laughs> this is, this is not luck. This is real, real effort. And, 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 and everybody's yeah. really trying to, regardless of what the ups and downs are on the market, try to solve the problem of decentralization, participation, and fair access uh, to the best thing in the world, whether that's you know, financial return or meaning that you derive along the way and friends you make. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to exactly. be, be able to have this conversation with you and uh, as always with the community thank you very much for your time and attention until next time take care